Thanks, Eddie. Here he is, that old... That old ghost man himself, 17 years we've been doing this on Halloween night. That's right. And you're back, you're just off the ghost hustings, I say. Just off the five-hour run and uh, hit 13 locations again, as usual. Isn't that amazing? And uh, we're into our 17th year. We're going to take a quick break and come back with Richard Crow, the ghost hunter, my regular guest, my only guest on Halloween. The only guest you'd ever want to have on Halloween. City Oldsmobile. No gimmicks, just great prices. 5515 West Irving Park Road, east of Central in Chicago. City Olds, serving all of Chicago land. Horse racing fans, the action is about to begin. Las Vegas style, when Maywood Park and Balmoral Park team up tonight and Saturday night to present Racing on the Ones. A horse race every 10 minutes. Non-stop action from 21 races in a row. How lucky can you get? This is the ticket. 21 exciting races that will leave you breathless. 10 races from Balmoral, 11 races from Maywood. And you can watch and bet all 21 at your nearby OTV parlor or catch the action live at Maywood Park or Balmoral Park. This is horse racing heaven. You can bet on it. 21 races tonight, 21 races Saturday night. Head out to Maywood. Head out to Balmoral. Head out to your nearby OTV parlor. Put yourself on a winning streak tonight, Saturday night. First race, 7.45. Come on, get lucky. Well, we got to give you Chicago's weather on this Halloween night. I'm Ed Schwartz. If you want to say a little, Rich Crow, the ghost hunter, 591-7200. Overnight, cloudy and mild. Occasional drizzle turning to all rain. Temperatures holding in the 50s. And today, uh, Halloween post uh, one, plus one, rain. Thunderstorms, windy and mild today, high the upper 50s. Right now, 54 to O'Hare, 54 downtown, 55 midway. Humidity at 93%, the east wind at 12 miles an hour. I'm Ed Schwartz on our annual Halloween program right here on WGN Chicago. I want to... Uh, Officially welcome our guest tonight, Richard, Go, uh, Richard Crow, the original and uh, uh, the only real ghost hunter around this community. The original, this man goes back in this field a long time. He's an investigator of the unusual, the paranormal. He's the one with the credentials. And uh, it's a fascinating story. We'll have him explain how it all began. And, uh, of course, we will answer phone calls uh, for Rich tonight. So you should know, I got a call from a guy in Massachusetts who said he tunes in uh, to hear this show because they're on. And I want to say hello to all the guys down at Chanute Air Force Base and Ram Tool, the Minuteman Missile Technician Splash. They're all up tonight listening, too. So if tomorrow they uh, end up launching a missile and it goes the wrong way, <laughs> it may be our fault, huh? I hope in Massachusetts uh, they're getting ready for next year. You know, it's the 300th anniversary of the Salem Witchcraft Trials. In 92, 1692 to 1992. How are you going to celebrate that? Well, I'm going to be taking a group of people out there. And, uh, May, you should come along on that, Ed. We'll wow. introduce you to some nice witches out there. I've met a few right here in town. By the by, um, there was something else I was going to tell you. What the heck was it? was something other, some other message I was supposed to give you. Uh, well, when it comes to me, I will, I will mention it. I did a program the other night on vampires. And uh, that was kind of interesting, but uh, it is, oh, you know what, I just remembered that uh, Kim is, Ro is Rob in the control room there? When it comes back then, tell him I want the letter back that I got a couple of days ago from somebody who wanted me to ask Richard some questions. I gave him a letter to get back to me tonight, and uh, I don't know where he put it, but uh, tell him it's the letter for the ghost show. And again, the number is 5917200. Just for historical purposes... Um, Halloween got its origins in what? Where did this date come from? What is its purpose? Why was why why was it invented? Well, Halloween goes way back into the agricultural communities of Western Europe. Goes back to the uh, people who give us Stonehenge. Goes back to the ancient Celts, and uh, it is based on an agricultural system where this is the time the crops are harvested. We're getting ready for winter. You've got a uh, full uh, pantry there, and you're ready to uh, kick back and. Uh, Get ready for the winter and maybe think about what happened earlier in the year. Think about those who've passed on. And, uh, you know, the old Farmer's Almanac begins November 1st. 
So they're based on the same kind of agricultural calendar. So this has always been the time of year considered to be the best time for the dead to come back and take care of unfinished business and give a sign, uh, pass through one more time before the winter, before they move on to their happy hunting ground or wherever. And uh, that's the basis of the uh, uh, Christian concept of All Saints Day, All Souls Day, and, of course, the eve of All Saints is Halloween, All Hallows' Eve. And that's what everybody's been out uh, getting into tonight, out there dressed up like ghosts and goblins and uh, things that go bump in the night. Last night I made a call to a friend of mine who does the all-night show at WJR in Detroit for Devil's Night to find out if the arsonists were out to edge play. And there were a few fires set, but apparently the Devil's Night activity in Detroit was way off what it has been in previous years. Do you know what the origins of Devil's Night are? No, Devil's Night seems to be a, a, just an American invention, a Detroit invention. Um, and, of course, uh, they'd have to run out of places to burn eventually. I mean, uh, I guess it's pretty much of a garage burning and wooden structure burning. I mean, they've had such nasty nights over the years, Ed, that we've been listening to uh, uh, to the reports that they, they have to run low on the types of buildings to burn after a while. So I can see where that would eventually uh, peter out. But uh, yeah, Devil's Night is uh, not really based in any long-standing tradition. It's relatively new, from what I can tell. So don't confuse it with uh, practices of old. Is that is that your pager going off? Yep. Somebody's paging a ghost hunter at this hour? Mm-hmm. Are they really? Boy, I'll, I'll tell you, haunting a moment, huh? Yep. Whatever it takes. We uh, have a lot of calls coming in, but I want to talk a little bit about the ghost tour that you do. Uh, when you first began doing this about 400 years ago, um, well, let me give a little historical perspective. I first learned about Richard Crow in a major sometimes article uh, written by a man who's no longer there. John Zionek was a reporter for the Sun-Times. And there was this fascinating article about a ghost hunt that he went on as a newspaper reporter up to uh, Wisconsin. And went along with Richard Crow here. You guys were looking for lights in the farm field, I think it was, right? Is that about where it was? This was a um, abandoned bit of property, Ed, which is now... Uh uh, now a private property again, a private home. But back when we visited, uh, it was in a uh, area of farms, and this property was uh, vacant. And there had been a uh, farmhouse out there, some kind of construction. But when we when we visited, it was only uh, debris and cinder blocks and so forth. And uh, I had heard from people up in the Kenosha area about things going on there at night, about uh, strange activity. Uh, uh, ghostly reports, and it sounded good to me, and that was when I was first getting started, and John Zymek had contacted me and wanted to go on a ghost hunt, as he put it. And I had to explain to John, well, John, you're certainly welcome, but you've got to understand that uh, uh, most so-called ghost hunts wind up being... Uh, well, you're in demand tonight. I guess so. Most of the, uh, most of the ghost hunts wind up being, uh, uh, you know, a waste of property, a waste, a waste of time, I should say, and we're going to get up to some property, and there's going to be... Uh, um, uh, you know, nothing up there when we get there. So uh, uh, I said, keeping that in mind, we'll go and uh, check it out. And uh, lo and behold, that night we did strike pay dirt. We really found some some very interesting uh, material up there. We uh, went up there and we uh, actually bumped into a situation where we observed bluish gray silhouette shaped forms and heard muffled voices, muffled sounds. I read the newspaper article and John got me uh, in touch with you. I called you to do a radio show. That was 17 years ago, and we've been doing them ever since. Yep, we certainly touched a nerve. Everybody wants to hear ghost stories, especially now towards Halloween. I want to ask you a question, though. With the advent of the slasher movie, with the, uh, with the coming of all the Halloween movies, I guess Halloween number 8 is coming out, and Texas uh, Chainsaw Massacre movies, and uh, films of that ilk. Have we gone a little bit too far over the edge and taking... You know, the, 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 the concept of scary movies and, and really going too far. I mean, I find some of them really reprehensible. I think some of the uh, the Halloween movies and Friday the 13th movies have, have really overdone it. Yeah, and we lose context. We, we lose contact, I should say, with the reality of ghost stories because uh, when you see this kind of uh, three-dimensional, scary, uh, uh, really colorful and gory type uh, ghostly things on screen, 
that's not the reality of 99% of all ghostly encounters. As we've been doing uh, calls for many, many years, Ed, you can see from the calls we get from people, the ones that are legit are the ones that are, the ones that are simple, the ones that are uh, subtle, uh, the tap on the shoulder, the cold, uh, cold chill up your spine, the, the disembodied voice whispering your name, things of that nature. That's the reality of ghost stories, not the, uh, uh, not the Freddy Krueger type thing, which is extremely rare. If ever, uh, that's too, too out of out of hand, but I mean, uh, even Resurrection Mary he never gets as uh, uh, blatant and violent as a Freddy Krueger, of course. Uh, and as truly as it really milked the Freddy Krueger concept too far, uh, it, it, it's gone from just being, you know, a mild horror movie uh, to so much blood and violence that I really wonder if some of those films couldn't affect people who are already on the border of uh, uh, maybe some kind of problem. I, and I don't think they're suitable for young kids, and yet young kids are watching them at an alarming rate, and I wouldn't be surprised having nightmares and daymares and things thrown in between. Little tiny kids, four, five, and six, shouldn't be watching murder. They shouldn't be watching slashing or people cut up with chainsaws. It's not good for their mental health. It really isn't, and I can't believe the parents will let their kids watch that stuff. And they do. It's a little different than the good-natured stuff that we talk about here mm -hmm. on the radio. I, and I want to make that real clear. We never get in to slasher stories and that kind of stuff because it's all garbage. No, because uh, the ghost stories we talk about, uh, they're not physically harmful. There's not a uh, uh, fear of physical danger to your body, to your well-being. That is not a ghost story, and it never has been part of literature, part of our culture, to have ghosts act in that fashion. From Dickens on back, I mean, ghosts don't operate the way the Freddy Krueger type characters exactly. in modern film do. And I want you to listen to Richard when he says that, because Richard comes at this from an academic background. This is a man with a with a wonderful education. He's been involved in literature and uh, urbanology. This is a guy with a good foundation for this. Anybody else that tries to sell you anything, you should run away from. You know, we're dealing here with a guy who's got some intellect. He's a world traveler, he's traveled all over the world, and he brings back stories, he brings back information, uh, he brings back, uh, you know, some things that might frighten you, but it's done with a, uh, you know, a good, a, a good nature literary delivery. I hope I'm... No, thank that you. Right. I mean, that's, that's what I try to do, Ed, and... Uh, Class I, is I, the word. Well, thank you, but I think... Uh, the fact that I do have people back year after year, of course, on my tours and such, I think is a, uh, a test to the fact that I give them the, uh, the straight material, and I don't try to uh, hype it, and I try to give them exactly the way it is, and give them, uh, when I present a story, I'll do the historical background, the, uh, uh, give them the folklore, the geography, the uh, first-hand accounts, the uh, possible uh, interpretation of it, but I let people make up their own mind what it's all about. I, I, uh, I had a vision of you a couple of days ago. Uh, or last week, I was getting out of my car. And I don't remember where it was in the parking lot somewhere. And I had this tremendous aroma of something floral just in the air. And I looked around. I actually stopped a moment. I looked around to see if I was near a funeral home or something. I don't know where it came from, but it just descended on me. It was really weird. It made me think of when you described the... You know, the yes, well, sense. psychic sense, uh, they, they do occur. And uh, we just had it happen again on a tour recently. I was doing a trip for Moraine Valley College. I do them every year. Good, uh, good study people out there in uh, uh, the Palos area. And uh, we had a full bus load over at the Robinson Woods Indian Burial Ground, which we've talked about many times on this program. The Indian Burial Ground in East River Road, just north of Lawrence. We're visiting that place during the day. And, of course, ghostly encounters can happen in the day as well as the night. It sure. doesn't have to be at night. And about six of us walking back to the bus, uh, the tail end of the group, uh, and this is interesting how it occurs, and uh, anybody who's ever had this happen will be able to uh, uh, to verify this. We're walking along. It's like walking suddenly into a, a wall of flowers, or a wall of a, it wasn't really flowers this time, but a very sweet smell, sweet scent. It says, "Boom!" You you're walking, and you it hits you, and by the time you realize what you know, you stop in mid step, in mid stride, and uh, it's gone. You back up. You can't find it, and it's there, and then it's uh, uh, then it's gone. But uh, it's a pretty pretty weird situation uh, out there at the Robinson Woods site. This has happened many many times. That's uh, that's one of many stories we'll talk about. We're going to take a quick break. We're coming back with Richard Crow, the Ghost Hunter. We'll not only tell you how to go out on one of his tours, but if you have a question about something uh, involving the unknown, give us a call 
Area code 312, and the number is 591-7200. We'll be right back. Spiegel Outlet, Spiegel Outlet, it's the smart place to shop. Spiegel Outlet, Spiegel Outlet, it's the smart place to shop. All the savings of an outlet store are the names that Spiegel is famous for. Shop smart for what you wear. Shop smart for your home. If a soft, luxurious lamb leather coat is on your wish list, this is the week. For a limited time, Spiegel Outlet is taking 50% off women's lamb leather coats. Women's lamb leather swing coat for just $139.99. Lamb duster just $169.99. Lamb trench coat $159.99. Save 50% on men's leather and suede coats. Last day, Thursday. Spiegel Outlet, Spiegel Outlet. It's the smart place to shop. Spiegel Outlet, Spiegel Outlet. Chicago, Countryside, Deerfield, Downers Grove, Morton Grove, Naperville, Orland Park, Palatine, and Villa Park. I didn't know why I felt that way. Why I couldn't sleep or eat, cared less about anything in the world. I just started crying over nothing. At Forest Psych Care Hospital, we understand what it's like to be affected by depression. What I needed was a friend. What I found was people who could help. For over 30 years, Forest Psych Care Hospital has understood that depression has causes. And there is treatment. Call Forest Psych Care Hospital at 708-635-4100. I guess I forgot how good things could be. You already know it won't cost you an arm and a leg to stay at the Hotel Lincoln, but a ticket to see the world champion Chicago Bulls probably will. Unless you take advantage of the Hotel Lincoln Chicago Bulls packages. Now, your perfect sports getaway is a phone call away. The Hotel Lincoln has tickets to every Bulls home game in a package that won't slam dunk your wallet. Your Bulls package includes a great room with a lake view, dinner at a classic Chicago restaurant, Bigsby's Bar and Grill, where Michael Jordan hangs his hat, plus tickets to see the Bulls with transportation to and from the game included. Call 312-664-3040 now and reserve your package today. Packages are available for every game and will go fast. So call today, 312-664-3040. And don't miss the WGN Radio Fan Van on Sunday, November 3rd at the Hotel Lincoln. The Fan Van will roll in from noon until 3 p.m. and you can get your own personalized Bears football card. Register for weekend getaways, Bigsby's dinners, and more. Hotel Lincoln at 1816 North Clark in Chicago, overlooking beautiful Lincoln Park. And we're going to pause for news. We'll be right back with Richard Crow, the ghost hunter, at 591-7200. This is WGN Chicago. I'm Ed Schwartz at 102 in the morning. Now WGN News brought to you by Jewel Food Stores. Take a new look at an old friend, and here's Dick. And Jewel, and you're on. Jewel's getting down to basics with menu planning staples at down-to-earth prices. Start with Grade A frozen Genio turkey breast, just 99 cents a pound. Limit one with a $10 purchase. Pour yourself a glass of Field Press 1% milk or Dean skin milk, only $1.49 a gallon. Limit two with a $10 purchase. And savings come in bunches with Farm Stand Golden Ripe Bananas, just 29 cents a pound through Wednesday. Each year as holiday time approaches, Chicagoland faces the same problem. How to say happy holidays to friends? The answer is simple. Jewel gift certificates. Available in denominations up to $50. They're redeemable at any Jewel or Osco. Order yours by calling 708-531-6853. Or visit the service desk of your nearby Jewel. And take care of your holiday gift giving with Jewel gift certificates. Overnight weather, drizzle and fog, temperatures holding in the 50s. Friday, rain, thunderstorms, windy and mild. High in the upper 50s, turning cooler in the afternoon. Friday night, showers ending early, very windy and much colder, low around 30. Saturday, mostly cloudy, windy and cold, high in the mid-30s. 56 now at Midway, 55 at the lakefront and officially at O'Hare Field. 90% humidity, southeast wind at 10 miles an hour, barometer 29.84 and falling. That's WGN News. I'm Dick Sutliff. Now again, back to Chicago Eddie Schwartz. On our Halloween show. And as we go back to Richard Crow, our ghost hunter buddy, what better way to do it than with a ballad of Resurrection Mary the Hitchhiking Ghost. <laughs> I remember 
she was very cold So strangely beautiful I slept her up and carried her home Resurrection Mary there ever was that I know of. Uh, well, okay, there's another one. But there's only two. Rich Crow, the ghost hunter, is here 12 minutes after. So uh, how many people went out on the ghost tour tonight? We had our 70-passenger uh, coach from Mid-America tonight, Ed. Uh, it's the big one, the slinky one. Filled. It's, it's uh, Every seat was sold. It's the slinky bus. What time uh, did you uh, leave? Or time 7 to midnight. In? Seven to midnight. Anything unusual will happen tonight out on the Actually, floor? tonight, you know, it was so calm for Halloween, I couldn't believe it was Halloween. You couldn't. I don't know what was wrong or whatever, but, I mean, it was real quiet out there. You didn't see very many, you didn't see any kids on the streets. And uh, just was real quiet. I think Halloween is changing considerably. I think with all the street crime and with all the drug peddling and all the problems out there uh, that we just happen to have in society today, that most parents don't encourage their kids to go out, and hopefully uh, even teenagers are told they're going to go to organized events. And a number of communities have them, park districts and schools, and black clubs have been happy. It's much better keeping everybody safe. I think trick-or-treating will never be what it once was when we were, or what it was even when we were kids. Right. I mean, you would go out with, uh, with impunity. I mean, you would go out for hours and hours and hours. I mean, I can remember... We would come home in my neighborhood with, you know, two huge shopping bags of, of, of stuff filled up to the top. And we would wander over a wide area, but we, we were safe. And we find all safe. the stores that gave the nickel candy bars on. I, and you could do what we used to do, some of us, have more than one mask and hit, hit people <laughs> twice. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's right. We had one guy in the neighborhood... We used to give out nickels, and we used to borrow each other's masks, and we'd hit this guy like five times in a day. 
I mean, you know, I make 25 cents off of that, that stop. And, and then there was a grocery store on 100th and Yates. And we would give away big candy bars, and we'd roll through there two or three times. We'd go to bed and take it away from it. <laughs> it was a fight at our house. 591-7200. A couple of things here that uh, we must ask you about. Just a little history again. Another, another two minutes. How the ghost tour, the supernatural tour, how Richard Crow, as a paranormal investigator, began his life. You were a student at DePaul University. Take it away. Well, prior to that, Ed, I, of course, was fascinated with ghost stories and uh, always was collecting data about various sites around town. It was so notorious when I was going to DePaul that uh, my geography professor, Dr. Richard Howe, who just recently retired this year, would one day ask me to put together a tour of the ghostly geography around Chicago. Now, of course, DePaul's Geographical Society had run tours of waterway systems, geological formations, and other rather textbook-type material. This was to be a somewhat different concept. But what would take everyone by surprise, DePaul and myself uh, included, was the tremendous response from that initial tour. That tour sponsored by the university turned away 200 people. And I acquired the mailing list. We filled up two more. I filled up two more buses. DePaul had no interest to continue, so I grabbed the mailing list. I thought I might do two more tours, but two more, with the two more, and so on, and it snowballed. And by 1979, uh, I was giving up my last real job, uh, as my father calls it, over at City Hall in Chicago doing neighborhood and ethnic history research. And I was always involved in some kind of uh, historical or journalistic or uh, uh, research type work and uh, gave that up to get into the tour business full-time. And as you know now, it's a day tour on the road, a night trip on the road, boat cruises during the summer, out-of-state trips, theme parties at places like the Excalibur and other places around town, lectures at the colleges, the high schools, uh, you name it, everywhere around the area. And further afield, I've been out to Freeport, Illinois so far this season. Um, I get uh, requests from uh, Michigan, Indiana, Wisconsin, and uh, really cover the area. Richard has also conducted tours uh, down, uh, down to New Orleans. Right. In London, in, in, next, Ireland, Next spring Scotland. will be the uh, eighth annual trip to New Orleans, third annual trip to Salem, Massachusetts, and uh, I'll give you a call from London in January on my trip to London. It really is a fascinating life this man leads, and uh, as I say, he's got the academic background to go with it. When I first met him 17 years ago, uh, he had just finished up, a, a, he was co-author of a book on the ethnic history of Chicago's neighbors. You know that book is still interesting to read. Thank you. And I still use it for research. So if you want to hear about these things, listen to them with a guy who has the credentials to talk about them. One of the things we've done is obviously picked up an awful lot of urban folklore over the years as well. Uh, in comparing Chicago to other towns and cities where you've been, is our folklore up there with them or even better, or where does it rank? We're certainly right up there, Ed. Well, you've got to consider the fact that Chicagoland has a population the size of many a small European country, and when you bring in together all the different ethnic groups, all the cultures that uh, make up Chicago, the big mosaic of Chicagoland, I mean, you've got a little bit of everything from around the world. So you've got Italian ghosts, Polish ghosts, Jewish ghosts, Irish ghosts, something for everybody. But speaking of folk folklore, uh, th there, you probably heard about this yourself, this is a big story making the rounds again this year. comes out every Halloween. The 10-story haunted house. Oh, yes. Have you gotten calls on that this year? I've heard. Tell me. Well, the 10-story haunted house, I'm getting calls like this uh, from people who say, I've heard about this haunted house, a commercial haunted house thing that's set up to scare people. It's 10 stories high, and it's $10 to get in, and every floor you complete, you get $1 back on your $10. And, of course, there is no such building. How many 10-story empty buildings are there around Chicago in the first place you could rent? How much would it cost to fix this up to open in that fashion? And if you did, how could you afford to give people their money back after they go floor by floor? It's implausible when you mm -hmm. dissect it. And I think this is the modern uh, derivation of an older folk tale, which I heard about a lot, and which turned out to be fruitless when I began to try to hunt that down years ago, and that was the farmer's haunted house out in the countryside outside the city, and if he went out there, the farmer would pay you $100 if you could spend the night without being scared and, and running off. So back in the uh, days when I was in college, it was the farmer's house that you'd get $100 if you could successfully spend the night. Although why a farmer would blow money, giving it away for nothing, just because you could spend in his house, once again, an implausible premise, but part of the folklore here of the area. Uh, another, uh, and that's interesting, another little uh, area of, of definition or discussion. Should a ghost be confused with or compared to or, or described as an evil spirit uh, 
or a spirit at all. Um, the reason I say that is, you know, you know, we have a benevolent ghost and Casper the friendly ghost. And there are people that believe in ghosts, there are people that don't. Um, but there are those who don't and are very cynical about it. I saw a little clip of The Exorcist yesterday on television again. Uh, you know, that's a very cynical movie. Uh, so, is ghost really a good word? And if not, what's a better word? And what, in your opinion or definition, does, does this manifestation represent? Mm -hmm. When I use the word ghost, Ed, and I use it on my tours uh, quite a bit, in fact, I originally ran under the title uh, Ghost Tours before I changed it to Supernatural Tours just to have more latitude to cover other areas, jinxes and curses and things like that, other oddities around. Um, to me, a ghost is any manifestation of the unknown that's attributed to somebody dead or passed on. So it is the idea of a ghost, which is most people consider something visual, the apparition that you see with your eyes. But it's also more than that, the cold spot, the disembodied voice, the psychic scent, the other things we were talking about earlier tonight that um, are other aspects of, uh, of contact with something beyond. I am often asked by people who hear you on the show, do I believe in any of this or do I believe in ghosts or have I ever had an experience? And until a few years ago, I would always said, say that you know, I have an open mind but I've never had an experience that I can recount. But I had one, and I think I've told you about this. And there's no explanation for it. Uh, in my father's house, on a shelf in his dining room, was a little piece of statuary of a little child that he liked. I think he got it from a florist friend, or it came with some flowers or something, but there was something about it he liked. And he was not a collector of knickknacks, but he liked that, and he put it on the shelf. It was a little, I guess it was a little boy wearing a Jewish prayer shawl and a skull cap, and he liked it. And he put it on a shelf, which was a very stable shelf. As a matter of fact, it may have even been built into the house, I'm trying to remember. And there may have been a plant on the same shelf. Sat there for years, sat there for years. There was no heating vent, no air conditioning vent in there, no way anybody could bump it. No breeze, no open window, no nothing. On the day that my father passed away, we were sitting in his living room. And in the dining room where the shelf was located, lights were off, nobody was there. Family was sitting around in the living room. Feeling pretty bad. We heard this ba bump. And that statue that had been sitting on that shelf for years, never moved, never touched, had on its own volition fallen to the floor and was laying on its side. That is the only experience I've ever had. I don't know what it means. It's almost as if he was it sent a message back like saying, you know, don't mourn, I'm not gone. You know, I, there's an element of my energy still around or something. I don't know, that's my... That's my way of dealing with mm -hmm. it, I guess. We've never really talked much about it in the family, a little bit, but it happened. And it had never happened before, and it certainly never has happened since. At that one time, when all of this energy, these people were in one room, you know, maybe 20 feet away from this statue, the only time it ever moved, it went by itself. There were no heavy trucks passing by. It was, a, you know, it was a residential neighborhood. It was quiet, nighttime, and it happened. So, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What do you think? Well, that sort of contact happens in many family situations. It might be the clock stopping. It might be the picture falling off the wall. Um, whatever. There, there's some kind of uh, telekinetic energy that moves something, does something, that is noticeable to people and can be attributed to something uh, personal. And I, I think that kind of the personal thing, I mean, it wasn't, uh, you know, just a, any statue, any knickknack or anything that, that moved. And of no. course, timing is everything. It was only his right. favorite, that's and all. Timing is everything, and the selection of the item that's moved or manipulated is quite uh, quite important. It's something personal. That's, that's why it really, you know, right. sticks with me. It was the only thing in that house that, uh, you know, he claimed as his own, I guess, in the way of that kind of stuff. 
A lot of calls. We better get to Richard Crow, the Ghost Hunter's phone calls. Hello, Cole. How are you? I'm doing good. Good. You're on with Richard Crow. Rich, I had the pleasure of meeting you a couple of years ago at a, a tavern out in the western suburbs named the Country House. The Country House, right. David Regnery's place, right. Right. And we talked at length about your tours, but we never got around to talking about why you are out there and uh, why that is on your tour. Okay, the Country House is a drive-by on my day tour. Unfortunately, it's so popular, we can't go in there and spend much time anymore because there's just no room. But uh, the Country House has got a lot of background behind it being haunted. Now, uh, the most popular, the most uh, publicized aspect of that building being haunted is the blonde in the upstairs window looking out over the parking lot. She's been seen beckoning with her hand in a seductive way for people to come inside. Uh, she's been seen in the window and seen on the first floor, in fact, by uh, at least one of the waitresses that I know down there. And I've never seen the ghost. I'm, I'm not real good at seeing ghosts. Then again, uh, you know, that's, that's usually a very rare occurrence. But I have heard the ghost of the country house on mm -hmm. occasion. Uh, David Regnery, who's owned the place now since 1974, is a good friend of mine. And uh, I first started going out there when I was doing radio work. Can I name another station, Eddie, out that way? Yeah. The old, uh, the old W uh, uh, T A Q in Lagrange. I used to do some talk out there. Uh, they've changed their format, of course, and uh, uh, we used to go out there to the country house because it wasn't too far from Lagrange. And I would uh, spend some time out there. David Regner and I had many talks about history, and he's he's very much into uh, into European history and such militaria. And uh, we would have many talks. And uh, finally, after a few years, he said, "You know, I think this place is haunted." And I said, "David, what are you talking about? I've been coming here for years. Why didn't you say something earlier?" And he was honest about it. He didn't want to say it was haunted until he was relatively sure that it was. And at first, it was things like footsteps heard at the top floor, steps coming down the stairwells from the top floor to the main floor, which never panned out to be anybody real. But then again, being an old building, a building going back to the early years of the century, perhaps it was an old building settling. So what really convinced David that it was haunted was the night a patron came up with his date and said, uh, what are you doing here, David, running some kind of a bordello? And he described a blonde in the upstairs window, motioning in a seductive way for him to come inside. David knew that that window was the window of a storage room. He had the only key to that room. He ran upstairs. Of course, no one was there, and nothing uh, had been disturbed, so nobody could have been up there. Now, I've never seen her from that window, but I've looked many times when I've been out there. But I have heard the ghost in the place on three occasions, twice on one night back in June of 1986, after hours, and once on November the 2nd, All Souls, uh, the same year, 1986. The first two times, it was a heavy thump, 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 like somebody walking around upstairs, and nobody was there. And the uh, third time was a weird situation of scraping and dragging sounds on the top floor, like somebody's pushing around heavy uh, uh, lockers or trunks or furniture, something like that. And when I heard that, of course, being naturally uh, suspicious here and wanting to make sure I uh, uh, had the, uh, uh, the right handle of the situation, I snuck up the stairs three times to the top floor trying to catch somebody in the act of moving something around. Then I realized that those downstairs who heard me walking around told me they heard me walking around. I couldn't hear it when I was up there, but those below not only heard me, they heard the sounds as well. So here was a situation where when I was right there where the sounds were coming from, I couldn't hear it, but those down below could hear me and hear the sounds at the same time. So I knew there was something very odd about the situation. But it's a great place for uh, food, as you know, and a uh, uh, great little atmosphere. The place has been uh, uh, fixed up with nice, nice uh, rustic wood paneling on the outside, a fireplace inside, boar's head. Very cozy, very quaint, and it's haunted. Right, and I've even heard some stories from some of the bartenders that say that even late at night, they have heard some things that just don't, do not fit right with them. It can be anything from uh, tampering with the electrical systems, the jukebox going on by itself, or the uh, cash registers going off and things like that, which are quite typical for electrical disturbances, but uh, a lot more than that, too. Right. Well, thank you. and, and Okay, we, uh, we, we uh, have something said there on the radio we don't allow, so... Uh, if you missed a couple of seconds of radio, don't feel bad. You didn't miss anything. We saved the day. Uh, Don, are you there? Don, 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 Don. Don with a question for Rich. Are you there? You put down the phone. Okay, John, how about you? Hi, Richard. Yes, John. Uh, there's been a couple of incidents where deceased family members' spirits have apparently appeared and talked to other members. Um, 
at my grandmother's house. These deceased family members did die in the house. I've never seen any of the spirits or talked to any, but I have twice experienced my grandmother's dogs stopping, looking around, growling, sniffing, and, and then walking away. Um, since it did happen with two different dogs on two separate occasions, I was run wondering if it is possible that these dogs were sensing the ghosts that linger in my grandmother's house. Absolutely. Uh, animals can perceive things, and very often uh, what would presage a human uh, observation is watching your animals react. Uh, dogs, cats, uh, you know, traditionally horses have always been the most psychic of animals, hmm. and a lot of our uh, uh, folklore uh, like the Legend of Sleepy Hollow, based on folklore from upstate New York, had the uh, horse of Ichabod Crane react first before Ichabod saw the Headless Horseman, for instance. So, yeah, horses, any sorts of animals can be uh, uh, certainly the uh, precursor there to what happens later when they pick up on it first. Very interesting. Now, thanks for the Thank call. You. Thank you. Now, I have this letter that this listener sent in, and um, dear Ed, I'm writing a couple of questions uh, for you to ask Richard Crow on Halloween. Uh, Mount Carmel Cemetery, you've been there many times. Right. Is there anything true to the story that there is a rotating grave there with the name DeSalvo on it? And if so, does Rich know anything about it at Mount Carmel Cemetery? Is there anything about that? The so-called rotating uh, uh, tombstone, there actually is a uh, stone built in two pieces that uh, rotates. And don't ask me what the mechanism is inside because it's been out there for a good 60 years and it still works perfectly. You just put your hand up against it, lean against it. You can spin this uh, family unit carved in stone around the base. The family name is DeSalvo. And uh, the tradition about that is a curious one. I think it's probably just folklore, but it's said that if you turn it around at night, it will be pushed back by invisible hands by the next day oh, to the proper position. I love that. And uh, I, I suppose someday I should be out there at closing time and do that, push it, and then run right out there again early the next morning at opening uh, the opening hour and see if it's moved back again. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't think that's probably uh, for real, but, um, I mean, who would have the persistence to run out there at night and back in the morning to check? But uh, it is a very curi curious thing. It's the only rotating, revolving tombstone I know of anywhere here in the area. All right, we've got more coming up with Richard Crow after a quick stop on WGM Chicago, where the number is 591-7200. It's prime time you headed to Doc Weeds and Niles and Lombard. Prime time is your time to dine on Doc Weeds' famous prime rib dinner for a special low price of just $8.95. Doc Weed's prime rib dinner is served complete with homemade soup, garden fresh salad, choice of potatoes, skewered vegetable, or rice, and Doc Weed's delicious rice pudding or ice cream sundae for dessert. Doc Weed's accommodates every appetite during prime time. Choose between scallops with lobster sauce over linguine, fresh fish of the day, chicken wellington, or tasty orange roughy. All Doc Weed's prime time specials are just $8.95, served with all the fixings. Prime time is Monday through Saturday, 4 to 6, and Sunday noon to 4. Dine at Doc Weeds in Niles across from Lutheran General Hospital and in Lombard on Highland Avenue and Butterfield Road at Yorktown Shopping Center. Ask your server how to qualify for a free prime rib dinner. Join Doc Weeds Prime Club now. Chicago's weather at 135 in the morning. Drizzle and fog overnight. Temperatures holding in the 50s where they are. Daytime today, the day after Halloween, rain, thunderstorms, windy and mild. High today in the upper 50s, turning a bit colder by afternoon. Looking ahead to Saturday for the weekend, mostly cloudy, windy and cold. High in the mid-30s is all we've got. Some cold air on the way. Right now, at this early hour on uh, our Halloween show, it's 1.35 in the morning. It's 55 at O'Hare, 55 downtown. 55 by the lake, 56 at Midway. Humidity at 90%, the southeast breeze at 10 miles per hour. We're with Richard Crow, and we'll continue in a moment. Richard Crow, the ghost hunter, is here at WGM Radio. And Rich, we've got a lot of calls here for you. Linda. Hello, Eddie. Hi, How are Linda. You? Good. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. What would you like to know? Um, or say? Okay, I'd like to uh, ask Mr. Crow a couple of questions. Okay. Just out of curiosity, I understand that you're very educated and very knowledgeable about the stories, about myths, 
and the supernatural. Mm -hmm. But have you ever encountered a ghost personally? And if you have, how was your reaction the first time it happened? Okay, Ed, uh, maybe one of the stories we should get into now is, uh, in fact, one that happened again last week, uh, the Clarence Darrow situation, the Clarence Darrow story. All right, so let's do that. This is one of these uh, really great stories that uh, we're just going to add something to. You, uh, you, I'll tell you what, why don't you go back, turn up the radio, and we'll have them tell it, okay? Okay, terrific. All right. Clarence Darrow, of course, a very famous lawyer when he lived. A famous attorney who lived in Hyde Park on the south side who had uh, uh, made plans that upon his death his body would be cremated. The site he chose to have his ashes scattered was a branch of the Jackson Park Lagoon behind the Science and Industry Museum. And there's a little plaque out there to this day marking that as the Clarence Darrow Memorial Bridge. And in March of 1938, his family, his friends, his mortars gathered there and scattered his ashes from that bridge into the lagoon. Now, Darrow, just like Houdini had said in the 1920s, Darrow in the 1930s said that if he could, he would come back and give a sign, and he would come back to the very spot where his ashes were to be scattered. And Ed, of course, every year in March, uh, at the time of the uh, anniversary of his death, a group of Darrow people get together and commemorate his uh, passing. They'll throw a wreath into the lagoon at that point, and they'll read speeches and pretty much uh, get into uh, uh, you know, a, a little pay on here for his uh, civil libertarian stance, but they're not really looking for him to come back. I, I was there in March of 1990 and was a bit disappointed because uh, they weren't paying attention, and I was, and Darrow did not show up. But I thought that was too good of a story to waste, so I incorporated that into my tour last year in October. What I do is every year change my Halloween tours uh, a good 50% or so, add new stories, change things around, because I've got people back year after year. And last year I incorporated for the first time the Clarence Darrell Memorial Bridge. And it was in the month of October, uh, weekend night, the middle of October. We got out there off the bus, walked to the bridge, stood there, looked into the darkness across the lagoon, and there in the back stairs of the Science and Industry Museum in plain sight was a nicely dressed elderly guy standing there in a long camel hair jacket, uh, camel hair coat like the politicians wear, you know, like Eddie Burke would have on, yeah. uh, that sort of thing. And uh, uh, we thought it was quite curious, this guy is over there. And, uh, um, you know, really, Ed, uh, as you know, anybody nicely dressed and elderly walking around any Chicago park after dark, uh, you know, they really shouldn't. They're going to be cruising for a mugging. So we thought it was somewhat unusual, and some of the group began to yell, Hey, Clarence, hey, Clarence, and the guy didn't move. And uh, we went back to the bus, and I totally forgot about it to the next week. We're back again, and uh, suddenly some of the group say, Hey, look, who's that nicely dressed elderly guy over there across the lagoon on the stairs? Well, what are you talking about? Right there on the left, three steps up by the railing. What are you talking about? I said, I don't see anybody. Half the group approximately saw him, half did not. It happened twice like that. But half the group saw this guy, and the other half did not. And uh, I only saw him on the first occasion. Now, this guy looked as real as you or I. So I thought it was just somebody over there in the wrong place at the wrong time. I did not think it was a ghost. And I suppose if we didn't have the situation where some saw the guy and some did not, I never would have really figured out that this was a ghost had it not been for the uh, second and third occasion. Now, that was in October of 1990. This year, we only saw something there once. And it was Thursday night, a week ago tonight, and uh, the group was over there. It was raining that night. And of the group, this time at the top of the stairs of the museum, uh, in the doorway on the right, there was this silhouette-type form. I thought it had to be a shadow. Uh, some of the group said no, and we had two police officers there, and they said no. It was really uh, a shadow figure. It was not, uh, not something natural. There was something odd about the whole thing. And later that night, some of the group were in from Indiana, from a um, music store, Rubino's Music Store out in Indiana. They called me, and they had gone back that night. They saw this strange shape in another position. And the next night when I was out there with the bus again, I, of course, immediately looked at the same location and no such shadow like it was the night before. So maybe this time it's not fully formed. But you see, a ghost can be that way. Sometimes it can be fully formed looking as solid, substantial as you or I. And detailed, so detailed you can make out a coat and the color of pants and uh, uh, the dress and so on. Other times it can be just a, a silhouette-shaped form and not fully formed. And uh, apparently uh, this is where Daryl said he would come back, and apparently there's something over there. Oh. And, uh, you know, he said he would come back, and this is the spot. So as far as I'm concerned, it may well have been Clarence back there like he said he promised he would do. A ghost can make himself selective so that he can choose who sees him and who doesn't. 
Well, Ed, I mean, that's the reason why you can figure out it's a ghost, and I think that's a very uh, a very good uh, attribute there for a ghost. If only some can see them and some cannot, you know there's something out of this world about the situation. If everybody saw it, then you could attribute it perhaps to somebody real out there, but this way, with only half seeing him thereabouts and half not, you know it's something quite unusual. I've often wondered if uh, those who do allegedly come back, do you think uh, their life has something to do the kind of life they led with their ability to come back, for example, Clarence Darrow was a very loud, dynamic, but he lived his life. I mean, he was a hard-working, hard-living person. And I wonder if that kind of spirit just doesn't rest well, and that's why they're allowed to come back. Well, Houdini said he would come back. Darrow said he would come back. That was a common... Uh thing back in the 20s and 30s with people uh, making this sort of pact that they would try to come back and give a sign. And uh, that is a form of unfinished business, that you are committed to a uh, uh, stance like that, that you're going to come back and do something. So um, maybe that was enough. But then again, uh, you know, Darrow was involved in all sorts of activities up till his end, and uh, he may well have uh, been under the pressure, under the burden of uh, uh, all the stuff he wanted to complete and never got around to doing, and uh, maybe that's part of the motivation, too. Interesting, interesting story. Uh, let's go back on a horn here. WGN, Shirley, are you there? Yes, I am. Welcome to Richard Crow, our ghost hunter. Well, yes, sir. Uh, I saw myself as a ghost. A doppelganger. You're uh, double, huh? Uh, well, you see, uh, I had this television set, and every time I would touch it, I would get, uh, I guess, the static electricity or whatever, and I would get shocked like. And uh, I uh, kept getting this, uh, and I guess it uh, built up so. This one particular night, I I, I touched it, and I, I, I turned it off, and there I was in a ghostly form in front of the television set uh, turning it off. Now, were you solid? Were you substantial? Or was it a silhouette I, or a it was, form? Uh, it was you know, like you see, uh, foggy, like in gray. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, hunched over the television set, turning it off, and I lasted, I think, for probably about 30 seconds, I'd say, and that scared me. Oh, that that, that was something. I, I never heard of anybody seeing themselves. Uh, oh, that's a popular concept from German uh, belief, the doppelganger, the human double. Uh-huh. Don't mean to tell you this, but it's supposed to be bad luck to see yourself, but uh, apparently it didn't affect you poorly. No, this was back, I was living in Chicago in, a, in this apartment, mm -hmm. and uh, it was, what, about 1966. Oh, then, uh, then I, oh, I certainly the, the bad luck's wore, worn off by now. I hope so. <laughs> Thanks for the call. <laughs> Thank I, you. I think she was getting a little static electricity off her television set, is what it was. Taking a trip down to New Orleans, I'd like to relate an experience that I had in New Orleans uh, in the St. Louis Cemetery down there, which is one of their, their right. older cemeteries. Number one, the one closest to the French Quarter or further back? That's, no, the number one. Number one, okay. And uh, this happened in July of this year. Uh, I was down there with approximately ten other friends, and we were taking a tour of the cemetery, <clears throat> and we came across what I could best describe as a wall of ice. Uh, as we were walking through the cemetery, we reached a point where uh, literally, I think, the, the temperature dropped, oh, a good 40 or 50 degrees to the point where we could see our breath, and uh, in wow. my case, my glasses uh, kind of fogged over. It didn't last for much more than a few seconds, but uh, it was just literally like we came across a, a wall of ice uh, within the cemetery, and of course, in July, you're normally dealing with temperatures that are up in the upper 90s. Yeah, absolutely, there. and that cemetery always is quite warm anyway. Where was it in the cemetery? Can you recall? Uh, this would be towards the, uh, well, along the, the tombs that are, are piled up that are sinking into the ground right as you come into the main entrance. Okay, which way when you come in the main entrance? When you come into the main entrance and you walk toward, you would come into the main entrance and you'd go towards your left. Uh, and you're heading, I suppose you're probably heading more towards the, the burial ground of... Uh, Marie Laveau? Yeah, Marie Laveau and the Italian... Uh, huge monument that is down in, in right. the general area. Uh, but it was down in that area, and it was interesting because everybody felt that it was in the group. And we were, uh, you know, kind of sweltering through the mid part of the day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it lasted for only a few seconds, but it came to the point where, where, you know, our glass was fogged up. You could see your breath for a period of time. And as fast as it came on, it ended. So I've never heard of that there before. I'm going to have to look into that. 
I have a uh, canine cop friend down there that I hire to uh, escort us around, and uh, he often patrols down that way. I'm going to have to see if anything like that's been reported. But that's a brand new one, but that's quite an encounter, quite a story. It's a beautiful cemetery, too. It's, uh, I'm sure there's got to be quite a bit of history in it. Uh, you know, it um, could, quite honestly, involve a lot of ghosts and other things. Right, and of course, many movies have filmed down there, Cincinnati Kid, Cat People, uh, uh, Johnny Handsome, all kinds of movies were down there. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the call. If someone wants to go on your tour, how do they do it? Okay, and of course, uh, like this gentleman said, Ed, I've got the New Orleans trip and Salem trips coming up next spring, and it's not too early to uh, think about those as well. But day trips, night trips, boat cruises, I've got stuff going all the time, of course. It's my only job, my full-time job. Call me at 708-499-0300, 708-499-0300, and I'll be glad to give you a whole packet of literature about everything I've got coming up. 708-499-0300. 708-499-0300. There is a mailing address. Uh, we'll also give that out in a little bit if you want to write it down. You still have your post office box? Certainly do. All right, we'll give that as well. 708-499-0300. Let's go back on the horn here at WGM. And uh, this is Dale. Hello, Ed. How are you? Good. Welcome to the show, Dale. Yes, Richard and Ed. Yes. Happy Halloween, belatedly. Thank, Thank you. you. I just want to... And we're we're still celebrating. Yes. Yeah, thank yeah. you. There, there, there you go. Um, last year, I was lucky enough to get through, and you talked about a haunted restaurant in Brookfield. Mm -hmm. And I'd like you to talk about that. And plus, I'd also like you to say for my friends Kyle and Tom uh, about the St. Rita Church happening. Okay. And uh, I'm about, if you go Kitty Corner, I'm about two blocks away from where the Country Inn is at. And every night when I drive by that, I work the second shift, and I never see the ghost, unfortunately. I'm still looking for her. Mm -hmm. One of these days, I will. Keep your eyes open. You never know who might get in the car with you. Yeah, well, I hope not. But uh, it, if she gets in my car, she's in a lot of trouble because uh -huh. it ain't very good. But if you'd comment on both of those things, I'll hang up now, and I'd like to hear about it. Okay. okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, we had St. Rita's, and the other story was... Uh... The restaurant in Brookfield? Oh, the re I'm sorry, the restaurant in Brookfield, that's yeah. right. We just left there, in fact. We used it again this year on the uh, on the trips. And that's Alonzi's Villa. It used to be a place called The Sanctuary. It's one of the oldest buildings in Brookfield. It's over by the uh, train station there at Prairie and the railroad tracks. And Alonzi's Villa, uh, it's been now in the hands of Mike and Pat Alonzi for about two years. And um, curious things occur there. A lot of uh, voice-type phenomena. A little girl saying things like hello and uh, uh, a, a chopped calling of your name by, by a voice that uh, can't pronounce more than one syllable. So if your name is Debbie, it'll say Deb, or if your uh, name is Eddie, it'll say Ed. And it uh, doesn't get uh, further than one syllable. Um, also, the ghost is a bit of a mimic, which often happens in some of these ghost stories. And apparently it mimicked the uh, German Shepherd that they have as a guard dog and uh, made growling noises and scared the dog out of the uh, second floor. Uh, over the years, the place has had a number of uses. The building's been uh, put to use everything from a bowling alley, and sometimes uh, uh, the ball rolling down the alley and the pins being struck can be heard by people, even though the, the alley is just a few inches below the, uh, uh, the current floor of the banquet hall. And it's been a house of ill repute, was a house of ill repute years back, and uh, it's believed that little girl ghost may well date back to those times. So a lot of activity there in the building. And uh, it's, for the most part, uh, uh, sounds and noises and voices and things of that sort. Uh, not anything more beyond that in the way of visual activity yet, but often this is the kind of, they've only been there some two years, this is the kind of uh, start that many, uh, a more elaborate ghost story has. And uh, we're just waiting to see if it develops any further. Okay, and I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll break, we'll come back, and we'll tell you that story about the, the haunting of St. Rita. That's a fascinating story. He tells it every year, and every year people call up and want to hear it again. So we'll take a break. We'll be right back with St. Rita. Don't go away. Horse racing fans, get ready. Ready for Las Vegas-style action when Balmoral Park and Maywood Park team up to present the incredible 21-race event, a dual horse racing simulcast that'll leave you breathless. It's non-stop action, start to finish. A new race every 10 minutes, 21 races in a row, starting at 7.45 Friday night and back again 7.45 Saturday night. This is horse racing heaven. You can bet on it. 10 races from Balmoral, 11 races from Maywood, 
You can catch all 21 at your nearby OTB parlor or head out to Maywood Park or Balmoral Park. 21 races add up to more perfectas, more trifectas, more ways to win money and have a whole lot of fun, Vegas style. Get in on the action Friday night and Saturday night at Balmoral, at Maywood, at the OTB parlor near you. Come on, get lucky. It's five minutes before the hour of 2 a.m. Ed Schwartz on Halloween with Richard Crow, our ghost hunter and paranormal investigator. Rich, what was it the, the, the year you first told us about the, uh, the story of St. Rita's Church? It said a long time ago. Right. Well, I've been telling that story. Now, that was, in fact, on my original tour way back in 1973. And the story of St. Rita's uh, has been with us ever since, although it only happened at one time. But it, of course, is really part of Southside folklore. It really is. It's more than that, though. It really occurred, and uh, I first learned about it when I was in grammar school. No, St. Rita's was a place at St. Sure. Rita's at what, 63rd? 63rd and... Street in Fairfield. Okay. And I grew up along 55th Street, Sherman Park area. Went to Visitation Grammar School. And it was there that I first heard about this incident. It was back around All Souls Day of 1960. The story really spread to the South Side. And I had heard about uh, what happened there at the church and eventually found people who were there at the time lived through it. And the stories I've been able to piece it together is something like this. There were maybe a dozen or so people there in the church praying for the souls of the dead by themselves and uh, uh, standard Catholic practice on November 2, All Souls Day. And as they were there in the church, suddenly the organ began to give off some wild screeches. So those in the church in attendance turned to see who could be up at the keyboard, who could be messing around with the organ. When they observed that nobody was there, well, then they saw that on either side of the organ there were hooded figures, three in one side in white monk's robes, three in the other in black. And these strange hooded figures were up there with their faces hidden in the shadows of their cowls. Now, they were up there in the organ loft, and the figures uh, were just standing silently, certainly something looking quite uh, odd, perhaps a bit menacing. And those in the church decided to say their prayers another place another time, and they would head for the side doors of the church to leave. The side doors at St. Rita's are located on the east and west end of the building. But when they got to those side doors to leave the church, the figures that were on the uh, in the organ loft here moments before were now gliding through the pews on the main floor. As they approached the people uh, getting closer, panic was setting in, of course, and a voice was heard to whisper loudly, Pray for me. The doors blew open, uh, were blown open by a cold breeze. Everyone ran out into the street, and uh, soon that story began to spread through the area. The pastor over there at St. Rita's at the time was a priest called Father McHale, and he tried to track people down and convince them not to discuss this for the good of the parish and uh, that sort of thing. Mm, I'm sorry and, of course, it, it was too late. Uh, the story was spreading through the area, and uh, it's now, of course, uh, reached gigantic proportions. Everybody on the south side, particularly in Irish communities, Visitation Parish uh, uh, and other parishes out that way heard about it, still talk about it to this very day. And to me, it's not a scary story at all. To me, it's a very, uh, uh, it's a cautionary tale. It's a kind of a story that has a nice, happy ending when you dissect it. Here we had uh, somebody coming, hoping for prayers, uh, perhaps to the parish where they had lived, and that whispered, plea, pray for me, hopefully was answered. And I like to think that whoever it was who made that request did get the prayers he or she needed and was able to leave with the good guys in white robes and not the bad guys in black. Didn't we get a call one night from a lady also who was there that uh, that time? Yes, we've received phone calls from yeah. people who were there. There's a priest at a south side parish who was there at the time. There are a number of people around who lived through it, and they can attest to the fact that it really occurred. And that is that is the uh, the story of the monks at St. Rita's, and I guess they still tell that story to this day, don't they? It's still quite popular out there on the southwest side. And nobody's ever disproven it. No, it's well. It's hard to dis, it's hard to prove a negative, Ed. But the point is that uh, this particular story is uh, is firmly entrenched in the folklore. Number one, and I believe uh, from the witnesses I've talked to, it, it does have a basis in reality. It really occurred. No, that's the Saint Rita's uh, Church uh, story. We'll be back with much more on our Halloween show on WCN. And that is one of Richard Crowe's favorite songs by Warren Zevon, huh? That's it, Ed. Okay, the kind of things that you uh, used to. Entertain people with. I just got your own, own ghostly haunted music library, huh? Mm-hmm. The letter I got from the listener uh, that asked about the grade that spun around. Uh, also, is it true that the old brewery in Thornton, I presume that name Thornton, Illinois, was Al Capone's jail and was haunted? I've never heard that before. Al Capone's jail? I mean, like, where he kept his... <laughs> Uh, that doesn't sound too legit. No, but, uh, that doesn't ring uh, with anything we've ever heard before. 
see what else is on here that uh, they wanted to ask about. A whole lot of things. Um, have you ever heard about the Phantom Horseman from around 95th and Keem Avenue? Certainly. You said on tours here recently. Talk, talk to me back. about that. I'm unfamiliar with that story. That was brought to my attention by Sandy Sierra and her husband Dennis uh, a while back. They had an encounter out there driving down 95th Street one night some years ago and actually saw this fog, this mist at the top of the hill as they approached 95th and Keem, which is high ground. And as they got up there, they saw that they had to stop the car because crossing the road in the fog in the mist were these semi-transparent horse and riders. That's a pretty nasty intersection. There have been some deaths there. Horses have been killed. At least one rider, in my knowledge, has died there uh, being struck by a car. And uh, certainly uh, uh, a lot of reason why perhaps there really could be uh, phantom horse and riders at that spot. Okay. Well, let's see if we go back on the phone here. WGN Beverly, how are you? Uh, oh, wait a minute. I went to the wrong one. Beverly, there you are. Here I am. A few, a few years ago, I was in Hiroshima, Japan, and I, don't, I spent an, uh, an, the night there. And uh, I don't know if I was asleep or not, but I remember the sounds of crying and suffering and total anguish. And I remember w when I realized that something was wrong and, quote, came to, unquote, the room was dead silent. And I had a very unsettled night for the, you know, until the morning. And one of the uh, women in my group asked me how I slept the night before, and I told her my experience. And what was interesting is that two other people on the tour had a very similar experience. Hmm. Uh, did you stay at, a, stay at a certain hotel or place that was near to a certain spot? or? Well, it was in Hiroshima. And all uh -huh. of Hiroshima, except for one building, was really pretty much um, devastated with the bomb. So it was in town, yes. Mm-hmm. It's quite interesting. I've never been to Japan myself, but I've had three Japanese film crews contact me within the last year. Mm -hmm. uh, the Japanese are coming here to America in a big way to film uh, various sites around town. Isn't that interesting that uh, they've probably got classic stories over there, but it's always the ghost story across the uh, ocean. The Business. Some of the people did suffer uh, oh, yeah. through radiation illness afterwards before oh, passing yeah. on, so it wasn't everything wasn't just quick. Right. And, uh of course, World War II is an area that we don't often think of in a ghostly context, but uh, I've talked to people who've been to uh, the Arizona Memorial at Pearl Harbor, and they mm -hmm. said you just pick up the feelings there. You can really feel uh, the same sort of situation you can feel for those who passed on at that spot. Mm -hmm. So World War II is a very fruitful area for ghostly encounters. Oh, yes, I agree. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. The listener who sent this veteran has a whole list of stories. I mean, you've got a... If we were to turn Rich loose, uh, it, he has hours and hours and hours and hours of, uh, of interesting local stories. I guess we ought to tell a story. We, we played this song, A Resurrection Married the Hitchhiking Ghost. Since that is the most famous ghost story, and hitchhiking ghosts, I guess, uh, are you know, occurring in other places, or maybe just that one has been extrapolated from Chicago. That I don't know. How old a story is it? What's the bottom line as far as they're able to tell today mm -hmm. with a famed and fabled Resurrection Mary? Well, Resurrection Mary, of course, that does fit the category of the, uh, of the hitchhiking ghost, and there are hitchhiking ghost stories in other parts of the country. Resurrection Mary, by no means the first, but she is the best documented. Uh, that's not to say these other cases that don't exist did not happen in reality. And uh, Brad Steiger talked about a hitchhiking uh, ghost, if you will, in a chariot in Roman times. And uh, then, of course, in Ireland, there was the case of uh, a young lady called Petticoats Loose, and she used to uh, get a ride in a wagon and go across the uh, gap between uh, County Tipperary and Cork, and she would go to dances and take off her heavy petticoats and just dance in her uh, one, you know, outer dress there, mm -hmm. outer portion of her dress, and uh, quite risque, I guess, for back then to take off those petticoats to dance. So there are stories that go back to the pre-automobile days, but it is the day of the automobile. That's when the advent of the hitchhiking ghost really, uh, really caught on. That's when these stories really began to be part of the uh, popular culture. Now, how, how old do you think a hitchhiking Mary, a uh, Resurrection Mary is? Is it a story? Yeah, the Resurrection Mary stories date back to the early 1930s, and they, uh, they definitely stem from the days of uh, uh, the early 1930s, 31, 32, 33, right around there. And uh, 
have been uh, quite popular ever since, and they, they wax and wane a bit, but uh, uh, there have been reports off and on now for many, many years, since, uh, uh, since the 30s, and perhaps the most famous case in more recent years, the one written about by Bill Geist of the Suburban Trib back in January of 1979, that was just prior to that famous snowstorm that would cripple Chicago and give us Jane Byrne as mayor. And at that time, uh, this cab driver driving along Archer past the Willowbrook Ballroom in southwest suburban Willow Springs, lost out there. He had dropped a fare off in the Payless area, was not aware of the area, not uh, uh, really cognizant of the roads out that way. He was a north sider, sorry, mm-hmm. got himself a bit lost out that way. And as he passed the ballroom at 1.30 in the morning, the ballroom was emptying out. So he sees this attractive blonde at the side of the road in a white dress. He offers her a lift if she'll just direct him back to the north side. She gets in the back of the cab. Off they go. Two minutes up the road, they're passing by Resurrection Cemetery, and she says, this is the place. He turns to ask her what she means. She's no longer in the back seat. Well, that cab driver, of course, was extremely upset. He wound up calling various police agencies in the area. He wound up calling the ballroom, and eventually he wound up talking to Bill Geist of the Suburban Trib. Uh, that was the Trib published in Hinsdale. And Bill Geist had interviewed this cab driver, and Bill called me afterwards, and he said, Rich, I don't believe in ghosts, but after I interviewed Ralph the cab driver, I now believe in Resurrection Mary. And that very popular column was one of Bill Geist's best. He's now out with the New York Times, and, uh, you know, of course, that it's just ironic, what a piece of synchronicity here, that Bill Geist's last name means ghost in German. Bill Geist is Bill Ghost, and he was the guy that uh, popularized this very, very uh, uh, well-documented uh, incident. Who do we think she was? A lot of controversy about that, a lot of talk about who was Resurrection Mary, her name, her identity, and so on. And as I point out, uh, number one, Resurrection Cemetery is so large with 130,000 graves, you've got a lot of possibility out there. And over the years, I've collected reports from different people who've stated different names. And we don't have one girl we can pin it all on. And uh, uh, rather than try to force the information to fit one particular character, what I try to tell people is, look, you've got a situation where you've got a lot of data. It doesn't all fit one profile, one particular individual. There might be more than one ghost out here, but tradition states it's a young lady who died coming back from a dance in an automobile accident in the early 30s. It was buried at Resurrection Cemetery, and some had the, the uh, uh, little bit of embellishment here that she was buried in her dancing dress and her dancing slippers on, and uh, does come back for that very reason. But uh, certainly there are many people out there who fit the physical description of a blonde, blue-eyed young lady from the uh, early 30s who uh, would be uh, dying young and buried out there at the cemetery. Back in the 20s and 30s, of course, even to this day, a lot of people die young. But back then, uh, a lot of people did die uh, at a younger age, and uh, quite a few people that fit that general profile. Now, the story that we've heard, and it's been a while that we've, since we've talked about this, is that uh, on rare occasions... Uh, somebody driving along Archer uh, Road or driving out in the area around the cemetery will see a young girl with this kind of dress on standing by the side of the road hitchhiking. They'll pick her up. She gets in the car, and then what happens? Well, they'll pick her up, give her a lift, uh, drive down the road. They'll be passing by the cemetery, perhaps. She'll disappear in the car itself, or she'll get out of the vehicle, ask to be let out somewhere around the main gates, to run down the private drive to the gates and disappear at or through the gates. And, of course, it's something that you can't fake. You can dress up and pretend to be the ghost, but you can't go through solid matter, go through a fence or go through a gate, or disappear disappear before someone's eyes unless you really are out of this world. How many people have you interviewed or talked to who claim to have had this kind of experience or encounter? I've probably talked to now over the years a good uh, four dozen or so people who've had encounters. Yeah, uh, in fact, uh, I bump into them every so often on tours, or I'll I'll meet them when I'm doing lectures around the area. Uh, I did not I did not do the Justice Public Library this year, but when I do a situation like that somewhere out in that area, Justice Willow Springs, uh, Bedford Park, that area, usually there's quite a few people around, uh, a number of whom have an experience firsthand. Uh, of the four dozen people or so that you've met, how many of them do you think were credible? Uh, I'm talking perhaps about, you know, three to four dozen credible. Uh, really? I really, uh, I've got a short attention span and a short memory for people who I don't uh, don't think are that credible and uh, usually forget those quite, quite quickly. It's hard to say the percentage because uh, I'm used to cherry picking here for the best reports, the best stories, and uh, if something doesn't sound quite right, I usually put it on the back burner and probably never get back to it because so many good tales come my way. 
We'll be right back with Richard Crow, the ghost hunter. Now you know maybe more about Resurrection Mary. And if you're out that way tonight, Rich, do you think it's still uh, possible uh, one might want to keep their eyes open? Ed, it's funny you bring this up because we're just, uh, well, we're going out about uh, 2.30 now in the morning, and uh, it's usually after 1.30 that is the best reported time for Resurrection Mary encounters. And I'll tell you the reason why. That's the time the ballrooms would be emptying out. So right now, the ballrooms are done, and she's on her way home. And, of course, home to her right now is Resurrection mm -hmm. Cemetery. Beware. You already know it won't cost you an arm and a leg to stay at the Hotel Lincoln, but a ticket to see the world champion Chicago Bulls probably will. Unless you take advantage of the Hotel Lincoln Chicago Bulls packages. Now, your perfect sports getaway is a phone call away. The Hotel Lincoln has tickets to every Bulls home game in a package that won't slam dunk your wallet. Your Bulls package includes a great room with a lake view, dinner at a classic Chicago restaurant, Bigsby's Bar and Grill, where Michael Jordan hangs his hat, plus tickets to see the Bulls with transportation to and from the game included. Call 312-664-3040 now and reserve your package today. Packages are available for every game and will go fast, so call today, 312-664-3040. And don't miss the WGN Radio Fan Van on Sunday, November 3rd at the Hotel Lincoln. The fan van will roll in from noon until 3 p.m., and you can get your own personalized Bears football card. Register for weekend getaways, Bigsby's dinners, and more. Hotel Lincoln at 1816 North Clark in Chicago, overlooking beautiful Lincoln Park. You know the difference between smart money and dumb money? The dumb money is buying custom window treatment at Mrs. K or Habitat. The smart money is buying them at Saxon and saving 10% or more on the very same custom window brands. I sell all the custom window brands that everybody else does, including Duet. But the guy who invented Duet just invented something better. It's called Symphony by Comfort Tex. It's a patented double honeycomb cellular shade that offers a beautiful blend of light and color and is 68% more energy efficient than Duet. We can make Symphony in lots of colors and prints to fit almost any window shape. And this week, we're introducing Symphony to Chicago at 70% off the regular price. Give us your measurements by Monday and get installation free with any order of $500 or more. I'm Alan Sachs of Saxon Paint. The dumb money sale at any other store. The smart money sale only at Saxon. Now through Monday. A better custom window shade, a lower price, and free installation, too. Guess where you'll find the smart money this week? At the Saxon Smart Money Sale. Now th I'm not laughing at me. Today, Friday, day after uh, Halloween, rain, thunderstorms, windy and mild, high in the upper 50s, turning colder in the afternoon. O'Hare right now, 55, downtown Chicago, 55, Midway, 56, humidity, 90% wind, southeast of 10. Ed Schwartz on the Halloween show with Richard Crowe, the ghost hunter, after a successful playing of the H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. And uh, we have a number of calls here. David, are you out there? Yes, uh, I might be able to offer an explanation on why St. Rita's might be a hoax. Boy, oh boy, I've never heard that word applied to that story. Um, apparently, the church has a hydraulic um, door system, and the door, part of the story was the doors were flying open and closed, and you can um, open and close the doors from a separate location. But apparently, about 20-some years ago, the um, system broke down and it had never been fixed. Mm -hmm. And as far as uh, people hearing uh, the organ playing and then looking up and seeing no one at the council... Um, the organ, the railing in the loft is tall enough that someone could crouch down in front of the organ, reach up a hand, and play on the keyboard without being seen. Yeah, but that doesn't account for the that doesn't uh, count for the uh, monks. figures, the monk-like well, figures. Well, could be people dressed up in uh, choir robes or uh, monks' um, cossacks. Well, we're, yeah, getting, you're we're talking about an elaborate. Yeah, monks. we're getting very really? elaborate. We're yeah. involving a number of people, and uh, uh, I don't buy it. You know, the only successful conspiracy throughout history have been the uh, small number conspiracies, not when you start involving large numbers of people. But run this by me again about the doors now. Uh, how do those doors operate? I've never it's heard that. Apparently, some sort of hydraulic system in the. Uh, there's machinery in the basement that. Um, you can open the doors in the basement? No, no, no. There's a, I don't know where the, uh -huh. the, the, the uh, s switches are, but apparently you can open the doors completely and close them completely from a separate location. Uh -huh. I would be willing to bet that that isn't true. I've never heard I, of such I, a thing. 
I remember the doors. I, I don't remember anything that looked that elaborate on those doors to do that. I mean, are a are, phone call would prove or disprove that. Yeah, I... these are the side doors you're talking about. Yeah. There's a front door in that same system? Um, I'm are the not front doors the front or the multiple door. doors? Just the side doors. Why? Why, yes, that's my next question. I mean, well, when the church was built, it was uh, to facilitate, I guess, uh, people exiting the church after a mass. Right, but what, the best way to get somebody out of a church is let them open their own door. I mean... I, I've never heard that. I've never heard anything quite like that before. I, it just sounds so totally strange. And on top of that, it would be a very elaborate system and very expensive. And uh, it makes me wonder. I've never and heard what, what would the motivation be for a hoax of that sort? Um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Now, you're, not, you're only basing this on what? This is your theory? Um, Come on now. Come well, on. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, well, okay. where, uh, we did repair work on the organ there. Okay. And um, he grew up in that parish, and he was, uh, you know, I was at the organ, and I can see where the, the railing is uh, tall enough, and from downstairs you cannot see if you're crouched down in front of the organ, number one. And he did tell me about the hydraulic door system. That's a simple phone call. We'll, we'll make a phone call, and we'll ask. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you. Thanks for a, a brand-new uh, slant on it. I've never heard anything quite like that before. I think I, 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 you know, I'm not calling the man a liar, but I think if that were the case, we'd have known about that years but ago. But then, of course, that if, if that were the case, would it, it, whoever was involved in the in the so-called hoax would be someone who, an insider, a priest or someone who was uh, connected with the church, and that doesn't sound very logical no, either. And it, wouldn't, so. and it wouldn't have been the only time they ever used the doors. A parishioner would have called us years ago and said, hey, we have a hydraulic door system. What are you people talking about? Yeah, I mean, about? If, if it was a well-known fact, uh, yeah, I'll I don't bet, know. I, I mean, if there's anybody from St. Rita's Parish listening that can confirm that, call us. I, I, I highly doubt that story. Dave, another Dave. Good morning. Hi. How are you? Okay. Welcome to the show. Uh, good evening. Uh -huh. uh, Mr. Crow, I had heard a story I read somewhere. I can't remember. A theory being put forward about uh, especially these older buildings with the lead-based paint. Mm -hmm. And especially during the uh, electrical storms, that that may be the possible that it's the, the paint in fact was acting as a uh, tape recorder, along with the electricity of the storm. Uh huh. Uh, have you heard of that theory? You know, actually, I have not heard of lead paint uh, in a storm connection. But in England right now, there has been work done on old wood containing uh, somehow the vibes the. The music, the sounds, the, the the conversation of long ago, and you can uh, pick up through the wood this kind of uh, uh, the sounds of, of uh, ages past, and uh, the pubs where sounds of conversations of hundreds of years ago could be uh, heard and replayed because of the wood. And I've got a very strange wood story here uh, in line with that. Not to get away from your lead painting, which sounds interesting. Have you ever seen anything in print about that? Uh, see, I can't recall, and that's what I was wanting for you about sources. I, if I would have seen something about lead paint, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sure I would have remembered that. But uh, a friend of a friend of mine from Indiana, Ed. Uh, in fact, he's probably listening tonight, Lyle. And Lyle, if you are listening, uh, do give us a call, and we want to hear this from you firsthand. But as I remember Lyle telling me uh, the story, Lyle has a. Uh, uh, barn built out of wood that he got from an old church on the south side of Chicago. The church had been partially burned, and he picked up this lumber, and when he built the barn, on certain occasions, when the wind blows in a certain way, you can hear organ music, or you can hear organ notes, I should say, because it's not the music, because the building has been built of jumbled pieces out of sequence, out of sync, and so as the wind hits the wood, it's just random notes of the organ that played long ago. Although that that may be explainable by just a small hole somewhere, which all that's all an organ is, right? Air going through a hole. So that might be explainable that way. Well, if it sounds a lot, I have not heard it, but uh, Lyle had told me about this, and if, I'm sure he's going to give us a call if he's listening. He usually does that. He's a mm -hmm. big fan of yours. And if Lyle's out there, I'd like to hear him explain this more. But your story, your story, your uh, question here just brought to mind the Lyle story that he had told me about uh, yeah. some time ago. Now about that thing in England. Uh, what? Did they document this? Did they experiment? And, or, uh, is it, or was it just a theory? Or this thing in England with the wood? Uh, uh, once again, it's something that I had read some time ago, and I believe it was in Fate magazine back during Kurt Fuller's days, uh, back a couple of years ago. But maybe somebody who has more information on that could give us a call tonight, too. 
but there were experiments being conducted in a pub in Britain where they said these sounds. Uh, it was not somewhere in the greater London area, or I'm sure I would have visited the place, but somewhere out in the countryside somewhere. Yeah, that seems very interesting to get a tape recorder on the history. <laughs> be... Right, right. The uh, most interesting to be able to pick up a natural recording like that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. You mentioned pubs. Uh, what about the famous pub, the haunted pub on North Broadway? Is that still a still there? Do you still go there? The Edinburgh Castle. That's uh, still in operation. I've been uh, switching things around here lately, the last couple of weeks. But it was a place that we've been at uh, many times in the past year, and the cold spot is still back there, where the former owner drank himself to death, and uh, and much more. Why don't you tell the story about the alcohol that disappears there? The uh, the idea of a drinking ghost is one that sounds a little bit humorous, but uh, there seems to be uh, a trend, uh, or at least there's a thread throughout uh, uh, history here in recent uh, the recent century or so that uh, a lot of these modern ghost stories have been collected about a ghost actually being able to uh, uh, consume or in some way manipulate uh, uh, a stock of liquor. And uh, uh, at the Castle Pub, uh, it's at Thorndale and Broadway on the north side, the former owner drank himself to death there back in 1959, and he was very much into uh, into vodka, cheap vodka, in fact. And after the uh, new owner, Jane McDougall, took over and transformed the place from a neighborhood bar into the only Scottish pub in town, she began to realize that there was vodka disappearing on a regular basis from the pub. And at first, of course, she suspected, uh, naturally enough, that it was one of her bartenders. It was somebody who was helping themselves to the stock, and uh, she was determined to find out who the culprit was on whose shift the uh, vodka would disappear, and she would mark the bottle with a piece of crayon at the level of liquid to find out when the liquid would drop lower and lower the bottle, only to find out that the bottle would have this uh, liquid disappear, the vodka go away, in the middle of the night when there was nobody there. And uh, soon she figured out that it was old Frank, who she had known before she took over the place, who was still coming back to uh, help himself to the stock. Did he still do it? Uh, well, it's hard to tell. They're pretty busy. They don't really watch it all that close. But I can tell you one thing. Mm. The section where the, the part of the bar where he died years ago has been remodeled seven or eight times. But the precise spot where they found his body is now a, a little booth in the back room, the middle booth in the back wall. Uh, that's where uh, many people have felt a cold spot on the floor. And their toes get numb. Their, mm. feet, their feet get cold. The, the numbness, mm. the coldness climbs up their feet, up their legs. And this has happened to many. Mm. happens a lot to skeptics, which is interesting, because I always will tell a skeptic, go, go sit there in that booth for a bit and see what happens. And it's almost like uh, it's a great uh, remedy here for skepticism for certain people, because boom, they'll sit there in bed and they have to uh, jump up because it starts to affect them. We'll be right back. All aboard Robert's River Rides for Mississippi River Boating the way it was meant to be. Four decks of unforgettable entertainment, fun, and games are waiting for you. So make your reservations now for the new Dubuque Casino Bell, the longest passenger vessel on the Mississippi in Dubuque, Iowa. Or enjoy the excitement on the Mississippi Bell 2 floating casino in Clinton, Iowa. Cruises aboard the Mississippi Bell 2 start at just $12.50 per person. Or if you want to leave the driving to someone else all week long, bus tours from Chicago are available for lunch and dinner cruises on both boats through your local tour company. Individual and group reservations are welcome, so call Roberts River Rides at 800-426-5591. The Dubuque Casino Bell and Mississippi Bell 2 Floating Casino. Experience the excitement that everyone is talking about. Call 800-426-5591 today. Welcome back to a world of play. Horse racing fans, the action is about to begin, Las Vegas style, when Maywood Park and Balmoral Park team up tonight and Saturday night to present Racing on the Ones, a horse race every 10 minutes. Non-stop action from 21 races in a row. How lucky can you get? This is the ticket. 21 exciting races that will leave you breathless. 10 races from Balmoral, 11 races from Maywood. And you can watch and bet all 21 at your nearby OTV parlor or catch the action live at Maywood Park or Balmoral Park. This is horse racing heaven. You can bet on it. 21 races tonight, 21 races Saturday night. Head out to Maywood. Head out to Balmoral. Head out to your nearby OTV parlor. Put yourself on a winning streak tonight, Saturday night. First race, 745. Come on. Get lucky. 
It's 2.40 in the morning. Rich Crow, the ghost hunter, is here with me. I'm Ed Schwartz, and we're going right down the line on the phones here. And if you've been waving, we'll be with you shortly. Hello, Pat. Yes. Hi. I had a couple incidents happen to me at Baxter's Grove. Oh, great. Great place. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and let me have Richard give this a little history before we go on with you. Baxter's Grove is what? Uh, um, belongs to who? It's a very old forest preserve uh, section, which... Uh, it was a private cemetery, not part of the Cook County Forest Preserves. Dates back to the 1840s. And Put a mic over just a little bit. There. Sure. It was named uh, Ed uh, Bachelor's Grove because originally it was founded, uh, settled by bachelors from Germany, and when they came over to become farmers in the 1840s, uh, they became successful, sent back to the old country for the girlfriends or sweethearts, brought them over, married, settled down. But um, the term Bachelor's Grove stuck. Now, after the passage of years, they die, need somewhere to be buried, and this is the site. And it's acquired a real reputation for being haunted. And back in the 50s and 60s, of course, a real, real big number of accounts uh, began to circulate. Everything from a blue ghost light out there at night to a disappearing house to disappearing cars. Um, unfortunately, it's also attracted some unsavory types, and there's been a lot of grave robbing and things of that nature. And because of that, the county board has ordered it closed, so it is not open to the public for uh, visitation right now. But uh, it really is a spot that uh, uh, has a great reputation for being haunted, which I think is well-deserved. And I just uh, certainly am uh, very dismayed at uh, what's come with, and that's the desecration and the uh, uh, vandalism out there. Now, what was your experience, Pat? Yeah, uh, me and a couple of friends were, like, uh, checking out the place and see, because we heard, like, a bunch of, story, a bunch of stories about it. And, uh, and we all scattered through the side, through the bushes, which was, like, a big, long, narrow path. And next thing you know, we just seen one one one, uh, one person that was with us just took off out through there. And we, and we ran after him. We were asking, why did he take off? He said he seen something white in the bushes. It was like a figure coming towards Adam. And it kept chasing him through the side, he said. Mm-hmm. And it was like and it was like one other time where it was like we're walking through the path, and uh, two of our friends ran up ahead. And so after, like, in the middle of the path, he tried to scare us. And so then we seen him. And we didn't know who it was. And so... And then finally, finally we seen them, and then we just took off through it, and then we came back. It's vandalism. That's what's going on. It's just kids playing yeah. out there. That's all it is. Yeah, that's what's the sad part. There's tombstones topped over and all drawn. Yeah, that's, all that, 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 thank you for calling, by the way. Okay. All right, that is not uncommon. We've seen a tremendous amount of cemetery and vandalism, even to the point of mausoleums broken into and parts of bodies stolen. Um, what's that all about? Is that is that for some of these... Uh, Important religious uh, services are going on from uh, Haiti or what? No, that's got nothing to do with uh, with voodoo. It's got nothing to do with uh, Santeria. It's uh, the satanic wannabes who are out there who are uh, thinking this is a uh, a nifty thing to do to uh, break into cemeteries and desecrate the dead, and it's very deplorable. I, of course, had worked with a lot of the local police departments as a consultant on uh, what's going on and what what the meanings of these different uh, rituals are, and uh, unfortunately, it's on the rise. What about uh, some of the um, the animal? Uh, uh, I don't I don't know if the word torture is right, but the animal dismemberments and uh, some of the areas that have been found in forest preserves with uh, pentagrams drawn in the dirt and fires uh, having been been built to sacrifice the animals and so on. There is an upswing in that area, huh? There certainly is, and it's. Uh uh, it's amazing to me the amount of the stuff that goes on that does not get reported that uh, you can find traces if you go to certain locations and check out uh, uh, various locales and you know that there's never been any uh, police investigation or there's never been any real uh, uh, work done. Um, oddly enough, there is in the uh, uh, west suburbs a police station. You can actually look out the back window of the police station and see a bridge uh, that's just loaded with graffiti and from that bridge sacrifices are, are hung on a regular basis and it's within plain sight of the police station so the boldness of some of these individuals is quite uh, quite scary too what uh, what are they playing with when they start to play around with pentagrams and uh, some of these imported uh, voodoo religions and uh, the trappings with uh, therein what, what what are we what are we doing there? Well, perhaps we'd best talk to a psychologist about it, but I think it's people who are uh, on an ego trip who are thinking that they're going to get something for nothing here by doing this sort of ritual. And uh, 
by performing uh, certain uh, incantations, I think they're going to uh, better their lives. But uh, it, it's a crutch. It's not really going to help anybody. And uh, they don't really understand what they're calling down upon. No, and that's the other thing, too. Uh, they really are unaware of uh, what they're messing with. Uh, the, the, uh, if they really believed that they were in touch with who they thought they were, they should... Uh, certainly be a lot fearful of what they're summoning up and how it's going to be out of control. It's uh, it's like having an infant play with uh, with fire. What about all the people today who follow uh, Shirley MacLaine uh, and her strange behavior and out there rubbing crystals and going to seances and going to channelers and talking to spirits and all that? I mean, even Oprah Winfrey now, I guess, has been so caught up in that that she channels and plays with the uh, Oh, this Oprah's, Oprah's channeling somebody these days? Well, I, I think she said she was uh, because of Shirley MacLaine. I mean, well, I, but, I mean, there are actually so, people who make a living now just selling crystals and crystal balls and amulets and all kinds of strange things. A lot of this stuff is harmless, of course. Uh, it, it, what really bothers me is that people who get into this very often are people who are, are, are doing it in such a... Uh, a fashion is to have a crutch on reality, and they're not really uh, able to lead their own lives. I mean, I've had situations where people uh, told me about using Ouija boards to ask the Ouija board how to make eggs in the morning for breakfast. This yeah. is serious, and uh, you know they couldn't cope with the real world without this uh, without this crutch, and uh, uh, that to me is scary. And that's very scary to me too. What's also scary is missing my last commercial. So we'll be right back with Richard Crow. If you have insomnia, you know what a nightmare it can be. But did you know that insomnia can be treated? Physicians at the St. Francis Sleep Disorder Center in the southern suburb of Blue Island specialize in treating insomnia, snoring, daytime drowsiness, and other disorders. For a consultation, please call 708-388-4624. That's 388-4624. At the St. Francis Sleep Disorder Center in Blue Island, their services can help. We have very, very little time left. If you would like to take a tour with Richard Crow, you call the number again, 708-499-0300. P.O. Box 29054, Chicago 60629. Time for one quick call, and then we've got to stop. One question. Go ahead, sir. Okay, I'm a student at the Paul, and I'm doing research on Chicago's first cemetery, which was on your side of Chicago River, north side of Chicago River. Mm -hmm. And in all my research, I haven't come across any ghost stories or weird stories associated with the cemetery. And I figured with all the buildings, I mean, it's the center of the city, there must have been something that happened weird in association with the cemetery since they've been digging up all the bodies and everything else mm -hmm. when they do construction down there. Do you know of anything that's happened? No, actually not. And uh, the, the Chicago Tribune map, which is a very good source for information, by the way, lists over 100 cemeteries in the greater Chicagoland area on that map in the, uh, in the legend of the map. And uh, I often wondered, should there be like a 100 ghost stories, one for each cemetery at least? And uh, not the case. Uh, a lot of the cemeteries, uh, at least nothing is surviving or nothing is in popular uh, folklore here about it being haunted. So I'm afraid I can't help you on that one. Do you think that's because it's so populated that it's whatever existed it kind of killed off not necessarily it's just that uh, often you have a hard time digging down through the layer upon layer decade upon decade of all the uh, activity at a certain spot to try to find out what's going on uh, it might well be that the spot is sort of drowned out by uh, background noise here of all the activity but uh, uh, it's hard to say okay thank you that's all I wanted to know really all right, thank okay. you WGN, DePaul, your alma mater. Yes, thank you. All right, Tom, real quick, because we're running out of time. I will, I will. Um, this is about the old Berwyn Theater on Ridgeland and 22nd Street in okay. Berwyn. Uh, a friend of mine at work told me about this, that he had a fellow that he knew that was upstairs cleaning in the balcony, and he was vacuuming, and all of a sudden the plug came out. So he went and plugged it back in again, and he was vacuuming again, and all of a sudden the plug came out again. And this time it was like four or five feet away from where the outlet was. Plugged it back in, started vacuuming more again, and then all of a sudden the plug was about six or seven feet away from where he was at. He went to plug it back in, and he heard somebody yell, Get out. Mm. Now this was supposed to be an old vaudevillian theater, and when he turned around to plug it back in, he saw this man dressed in the 1930s style, and obviously he said... He got the heck out of there as quick as he could. But uh, I don't know if you've ever heard anything about this or whatever. Mm -hmm. And 
I mean, you know, this, like I say, I've heard this secondhand, but uh, they, well, from what this friend of mine told me, that uh, he said, from what he heard was, it was haunted. It's now raised. It's no longer there. So, if you can comment about that, and also, please, Mr. Crow, write a book, about Chicago Ghostland History, please. Okay. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have nothing specific on the Berwyn Theater, Ed, except to say that many, many theaters have been haunted. And uh, around Chicago, you've got a number of uh, different theaters that had reputations for having ghost stories. It is always a pleasure having you on on Halloween or any other time. Richard and I are going to get together the week of Christmas, and uh, you came up with a great idea, which is? A Dickens Christmas, a ghost of Christmas past. We're going to have some fun. This is our 17th get-together on Halloween. I want to book you right now for year 18 next year. Is that all right? No problem. I look forward to it. His tours are a lot of fun. And uh, you got to try one. 708-499-0300. And you will send that, what, a brochure? A number of brochures, Ed, for the day trip, the night trip, and uh, a lot of activity planned for the months ahead. So don't miss out. Richard, what can I say? Halloween might be over, Ed, but ghosts are out there every yeah. week, every month, every season. So just... Partake in them another time, no problem. And the best way we can say goodnight to you is we always say Happy Halloween. That's right. Happy Halloween. Same to you, Eddie. Happy Halloween to Happy. all our listeners, too. Absolutely. And now, the rest of the story. Did you hear the one about the traveling salesman? <laughs> now, a traveling salesman from Cleveland who wagered over his head in a game of golf. If this salesman lost his game, he would lose more than a game. But that brings us to the rest of the story. As I say, he was a salesman in Cleveland. He was 25. His income just about equaled his expenses. So though he was a good amateur golfer, he dared not wager for high stakes until one day. Friends had invited him to the Pine Valley course in New Jersey. He had never played that course before. He had never played Pine Valley. And Pine Valley is a man-eater. More sand and scrub than short grass. You ask anybody who's played at Pine Valley as one tough golf course. Now, this young salesman is no hustler, but this day he has to hustle. He needs money, he needs cash, he needs hundreds of dollars. So the negotiating begins. Pine Valley can't be such a hard course, says the visitor, though he has heard otherwise. His golfing companions laugh. Would he care to put up a little money behind the boast? All right, says he. So confident is he that for every stroke over 80 on his scorecard, he'll pay his companions $100. His companions are delighted. Who does this kid think he is that he can shoot 80 or lower his first time around Pine Valley? But, says their guest, you pay me $100 for every stroke I make under par. Now, par was 72. Now his hosts are certain that this youngster has underestimated Pine Valley. They've heard that he's pretty good, but nobody is that good. So they agree to the wager. Now the first hole at Pine Valley is a monster. It's a monster par four. And our hero is already lying four, still 30 feet from the pin. But he sinks that 30-foot putt. Before he's even reached the second tee, he's already shooting bogey golf, however. $100, remember, for every stroke over 80. And there was no way for them to know that their guest was broke. I said he was broke. There was no way he could pay for even one of those strokes. He didn't have even $100. But to win what he needs, he has to break 72, and he has to. Well, that day, after that most important game on that most treacherous golf course, the brash young visitor putted out on the 18th with a round of 68. Four strokes under par. His take at the predetermined rate of $100 a stroke was $400. He'd won precisely the cash he needed, and his next stop would be at the place of business of a certain mid-city merchant. And there he left the $400, the exact sum needed to pay for what he had already bought. Well, it's many victories later now and millions of dollars in winnings and earnings, but the incomparable career in professional golf all began with a game he had to win in 1954. For that day, he was playing for keeps. He was playing for an engagement ring, which he had bought and for which he could not pay. And that day, he learned how good a golfer he really could be. He learned what he could do when he had to. And so that year, the Cleveland salesman made golf his profession, and he and it have rewarded each other ever since. 
The prize he won 37 years ago was a girl named Winifred Waltzer. Then and ever after, Mrs. Arnold Palmer. And now you know the rest of the story. And there you have it on WGM Chicago. And uh, Mr. Harvey came in a little late tonight, or he would have been here at 3 a.m. instead of three, uh, uh, 30 seconds after. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, but it was, it was worth it for, uh, for all the ghost stories and stuff. That's worth it. Halloween is, is an excusable... Halloween is, as they used to say in school... Um, oh, what was the phrase? There was a... Um, in your ear with a keg of beer. No, 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 no. Uh, it is a... Uh, oh, fully. This is awful. The nuns at St. Brian's... With a no, couple of no, that's not not uh, hardly. It up, uh, your, up your nose with a rubber hose. No, 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 no. What was the? Uh, I can't think of this. This is awful. What, what did they used a, to say? Uh, Happy Halloween. No, it was a. Uh, and don't let the bed bugs bite. That's what. That was it. Yeah, it was a uh, Halloween. Is a don't let the bed bug. Uh, what uh, that? What you said? Day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad it's Friday. <laughs> I don't know why. I'm, I'm still having Halloween. Uh, uh, things happen. I know. You're yeah. trying to think of a slogan and you can't remember it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It was one of those things that... Uh, was it part of Halloween? Was it tied into Halloween? No, it wasn't. It was uh, one of those... Um, not Holy Day of Abstinence, mm -hmm. but it was one of, it was one of those uh, uh, phrases we got in, uh, in Catholic school, and I can't think of what the phrase was. Uh, well, if I think of it, you'll be the second to know. You think you'll call me and let me know? Yes. That's true. Boy, oh boy. So, in your... You know, we got one group of trick-or-treaters, and that was all. I had none. I'm depressed. I had none. I'm we had the Halloween sleeping. tree. We had the skeleton hanging from the tree outside the house, the skeleton windsock. We had the big pumpkins hanging from the tree. Uh, I think it was a tree. very quiet outdoor Halloween. I think most parents now are just too wary of sending... Johnny even out. splurged and bought all kinds of candy and yeah. one group of trick-or-treaters. That's all we had. And now you can eat all that candy yourself. Well, there's that. I think the weirdos have ruined Halloween forever, and the recent crime waves that we have seen in city and suburbs and, uh, you know, kids grabbed off the street and what have you, uh, I think all these reality-based television shows have sent a very, very heavy message to today's parents. Watch out for and protect your kids. Yeah, yeah, I think and you're I absolutely right. I think that's right. what they're doing. And I don't yeah. think they'll ever be the Halloween of our youth. Yeah, it, it's really a shame because today's kids are going to miss out on something that was just a lot of fun. And yet, hey, if I was a parent, I, I think I would be just as cautious. I would at very least probably go with the kids and probably make sure that they didn't eat any candy. Uh, you know, if somebody wanted to give them little certificates to take to the local jewel or something like that, that's fine. But you remember but, uh, when you were young, you wouldn't have thought twice about eating no. something your neighbors gave you. Yeah. Candy, apples, whatever. Absolutely. No big deal. What was the worst stunt you ever pulled on a Halloween of your youth? Oh, let me think. I remember um, mine. Horse stunt. Probably just scaring people, you know, just positioning yourself in places where people would come along and all of a sudden you'd jump out and scare them and, you know, they'd say, You kids, what are you doing scaring somebody like that? Hmm. That was about it. I remember two things we did. Once we blew up a, a neighbor's mailbox. Blew up a mailbox? That is yeah. a federal offense. I know. It was out in front Mr. Sutliff. That is a federal Are you aware offense. of that? Are we are working with yes, a I wonder felon? This, I wonder if the statute of limitations has uh, run out on yeah, that. Yeah, that's why I meant to buy I don't check. think so. <laughs> uh, I checked. Then we went into a grocery store. It was around 6, 7 o'clock on Halloween. Yeah. And we went back and we bought like three dozen eggs. Now, this was a, a group of guys, and we didn't really have com uh, costumes. We just had masks. Yeah. We were probably around 12 years old. We were getting just a little bit old for Halloween, but not old enough to not play a prank. Yeah. Now, this was in the IGA grocery store at 100th and Yates uh, mm -hmm. Boulevard. Yeah. And then we went over to 99th and Yates, across from the Clark gas station. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. And we took all three dozen eggs, and we egged the ZPA buzz. <laughs> Again, we launched uh, we launched the eggs like you never saw before, and the owner of the store got mad. He came out because he saw us doing it. He said, "I know you were going to do that. I never sold you those eggs." And we didn't know from waste at that time, obviously, and we didn't think about it that some poor soul was going to have to clean the bus off. All we wanted to do was play this prank, and that's what it was: uh, egging a CPA bus. Mr. Schwartz, I don't know if Mr. Sutliff and I 
can can go on working with someone uh, that has this kind of a past record. I don't that's, know. That, that is the extent of my criminality. I, I thought you were an upstanding uh, broadcaster. However, uh, given the uh, the evidence placed before us, mm -hmm. uh, I think you may be in, be in deep doo doo. You know what broke me of that kind of behavior? It was that winter. We uh, we were hiding on 103rd Street near the bridge. Yeah. Uh, and there's a uh, Stony Island, and we threw some snowballs at a truck. A whole bunch of us threw snowballs, and the truck driver was driving a a big tractor. He didn't have a trailer with him, just a big tractor. Yeah. And he got very mad that we we startled him with the snowballs. He got very mad, and he came after us in the truck. And he chased us all over the neighborhood, up the streets, down the alleys. The way we finally got away from him was hiding on the roof of the garage. He scared us good. I, I think, mean, uh, we never misbehaved again after that. I think, Mr. Schwartz, that uh, Mr. Sutliff and I are going to have to uh, absent ourselves from your company. Then there was the time, though, and allow you to go out to the, uh, by, to the parking uh, lot where there is a, a bus driver who's waiting for you. No, no, we might have to him. Uh, where we decided to make some money, and so we took some broken uh -huh. glass. I better stop him yeah, before he convicts himself. Yeah, yeah. Say goodnight, Ed. Uh, uh, help! Mr. Fitz, help! There's light in the track of all with me! Help! Good place, Mr. Fitz! Help! 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 A federal offense. Yes. A federal of mailbox. You don't mess. No. We got it on A tape. A federal offense. We got it on tape. We do. We yeah. have it. John, did you know the Schwartz? Is is someone that has committed a federal offense? I've known him the past up couple a, of minutes since he just admitted it. Yeah, but yes. before, I never would have dreamed it. Blowing up a male citizen. I don't know if if we can uh, continue to work with this man. I uh, I better get to the news and uh, hope that the gendarmes don't get here. Uh, seven minutes. Seven minutes after three. WGN Radio Chicago. WGN Radio News now brought to you by Jewel Food Stores. Take a new look at an old friend, Jewel.